experience on the first edition. Welcome to Yash for the international speakers. Uh, I, I thought the hard part was until now, but seeing you so many, uh, I, I think I was in the wrong. Uh, because I was not such a, bad, uh, such a good speaker, we invited professional speakers, 14 international speakers, that will be with us during the entire day. Uh, I will bother you with uh, why we did the experience and who we are. I'm Juliana Alban from Etwise and Vicky uh, Costa. Uh, we are respectful of the experience. Uh, if you have any claims, <laughs> you come to us. Um, what we want to say is that we are truly committed to bring more opportunities like this for you. Reasons to stay in Yash, reasons to stay uh, and grow, and finally impact the IT community here. Um, have a beautiful conference today. I don't know all what else can I add. Mm. I hope it will be an inspiring event. I'm sure that you'll not find a lot of solutions today, and probably more questions. But this should inspire you to go and search and do the things right. So welcome to the experience and have a nice day to see Part will be room number two, microservices. Then we have room number one and room number three. Room number one is mobile and room number three is agile. You have the event agenda. Feel free to choose whatever room you like, whatever track you like. We promise that your chair will follow you. Okay, can you hear me? Excellent. Hello, everybody. Um, I feel a feeling it's going to be a really good day. I have four files and I learn more than you guys. Um, my name is Victor, Victor Parsi. I work for a company called CloudBees. Any of you using Jenkins? Oh, we're going to have a good time then. Um, so we are a company that I work for CloudBees, the company behind Jenkins, open source and enterprise version. Uh, what else can we do? I, I published two books. We can speak about that later, but what's more important is uh, I thought to start to kick off this session with uh, a very short history of my suffering through, through some 20 years of, of working in the software industry. Uh, at least when I look, look at it from, from this perspective today, I, I really think that it was, it was awful. Um, simply because of the challenges that we had a long time ago and, and that in many companies still prevail until, until today, right? Um, so I, I worked in many, many different companies, many different projects, from very small, green projects which are, which are really great because you can paint where people think that they do anything you want, but they never managed to tackle the real problems, but then I worked in banks and uh, lotteries, car industry, I worked in many different, um, different sectors, right? So, so, so I've seen it all, from, from really terrible projects to, to nice little ones that I'm proud of. Um, so the problems we were facing at that time, like, let's say 20 years ago, it's, we had those projects that took a year to develop, like uh, you have three, four months of development and three, four months of testing. And then the worst part was usually integration phase. Uh, you, you might be younger than me, so you might not have experienced that, that uh, um, suffering. But integration phase was the worst part of the project because that's usually when after half a year or eight months, we all gather because we uh, gather together that, that day we all come to the green places and we all take ourselves because we know what's going to happen. And what's going to happen is that somebody's going to push the button and realize that nothing works. After eight months of development and testing, things seem to don't work because we, we did things looking from this perspective in a really bad way back then. 
But okay, we, we made some proper paths to that, and we realized that uh, we needed uh, automated testing, so that helped. First five tests were absolutely great, and tests were even better, and then when we got to 100 tests, we all already realized that actually even automated testing does not help that much because they were failing more often than not. And then we spent more time trying to maintain those tests than actually benefits that we were gaining from that. Um, and then at some moment, at least I got introduced to, to extreme, uh, uh, extreme programming, and that was really beautiful. It was like listening to, to, to music, to like dream come true, right? And then we started applying that, right? We started uh, doing test driven development, for example, many other practices, only to discover that that did not work either because of many problems that we had. And uh, again, that was a kind of a failure as well. Then came integration testing, and that was really amazing. I said that uh, more often than not, uh, our builds were failing, and then developers started ignoring those failed builds, and many other, other stuff that were I'm not really proud of. And all that led me to, to the conclusion that actually the real problem that we had, at least at that time, was architecture of software. The way how, depending on how your software is architectured, you can do, apply some practices, or you cannot. Having huge monolithic uh, applications that are not designed to be tested, that are not designed using certain practices from the very start, means that you simply cannot apply many of the things uh, that you want to apply, right? You need to start from zero, in a way. You need to throw everything to fresh and start fresh and do things uh, well. So, my career, at least the last 20 years, were more often than not failure after failure, at least looking for this perspective. I was proud of most, most of those things at the time, but now when I look at them, what the fuck was I doing the last 10 years? It's really awful. Uh, I would never kind of go back to that. And back then I thought, ah, I'm such a good thing, I'm doing great things, but no, no not really. So, once we realized that architecture is, is the root cause of, of many of the problems, we started breaking those monoliths into, into microservices. That was like quite some time ago, before we had tools that we have today, before, before we have practices that we have today. And that proved to be, all, again, another disaster because uh, deploying microservices, uh, just like you, we were doing it 10 years ago to, to servers, that created a huge, huge mess, really, because Dependencies, conflicts, configurations, we did not know how to handle that. We just put things somewhere and hope that it will work, and that was really... So we decided that okay, we cannot have that, those problems anymore. We need to standardize things, and standardizing things led to even more problems, because once you standardize something, you, you effectively throw your innovation out of the window. Once somebody decides, okay, you're going to use JDK 7, right? That means that whatever ideas your developers have uh, are going to be postponed because they cannot really do anything, right? So once we started standardizing and doing stuff in that direction, we, we effectively slowed everything down, killed innovation and many other things. And then came that we realized that we need to do something about uh, how we put things and where we put them. So we started using configuration management tools like Puppet, Chef, CF Engine, and stuff like that. And that was really great because we got certain stability and we, we were able to predict how things will, are going to behave. But uh, that created similar like tests at that time, uh, huge problems with uh, maintenance. If any of you use Puppet or Chef, uh, on a huge system, uh, maintaining Puppet in, in thousands of lines of, of Puppet code is really a big challenge. Um, so again, yeah, uh, looking through this prism, we were doing really bad job, simply because um, the point I'm trying to make is that whenever you figure out something how to do better, the only thing you will actually manage to accomplish is to figure out new problems that lie behind uh, the problem that you just solved. So every time you improve on something, the bar is rising, and uh, what is expected of you is, 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 is kind of different. Um, so, and then you realize, oh, what I was doing before is not good, what I'm doing today is going to be better. Um, so today, what, what, what we are doing, or what I think we should be doing, which again will change tomorrow, 
because tomorrow is, is going to bring something completely new is, first of all, we are trying to use small specialized tools. No more of those big applications do it all and stuff like that. They're, they're disaster to maintain, they're disaster to, um, to manage, learn even. Uh, immutable deployments, uh, I don't know if you have any use Docker and stuff like that, that's really a game changer how, how we do things because simply things are suddenly uh, well defined and, and uh, self sufficient. Uh, low grid deployments, gone over the days of downtime, you can deploy many times a day, many times an hour, whenever you want, and things are going to simply continue working as, as they should. Uh, again, this microservices service discovery is a must. You cannot anymore rely on, on 20 operators configuring stuff and things like that. Things things to be auto discovered. And this is nothing new. This is this is all these things that we've been using for for years. Domain driven design it changed completely how we do things, how we organize our functionalities, how we architecture our software. Continuous developer de delivery deployment, continuous integration is dead, now we do all uh, continuous delivery or at least deployment or one of those two things, doesn't really matter. So things change. Um, again, one of the days of small applications, you develop your application, give it to somebody, now we're all building most of us big systems scalable. We are expecting our system to run on hundred servers, thousand servers to scale up, scale down, do those things that actually were almost unimaginable uh, uh, 10 years ago, not, not even more than that. So and now what, what I think is the next barrier and the uh, next place that we, are, we will be coming or going or some of us are already there is a self-healing systems, right? Uh, that's kind of the, the, the thing for this year. Next year we'll see, who knows, we'll find out. But before, before I go into, into self-healing, let, let's see first. Um, continuous, continuous, continuous deployment, delivery. Three, four, five, oh, oh, five. That's, that's, that's a good one. Huh? Okay, then see, you count as two, six. Excellent. So the continuous deployment, at least as, as a theory, is easy. Um, applying it is a different question, but it's very really easy. It's you, you provision your environments, right? You make sure that all your service, your cluster service is up and running and doing whatever it should do. You test, you build something, you test again, you deploy, you test, you uh, enable that something for your visitors, you test. You roll back. Huh? You roll back. Roll, no, roll forward, roll forward. Okay, we're going to have a discussion about that. There is no roll back. Anyway, you, you get a picture, right? You do things, you test, you do things, test, you do things, and you test them until they are there in production and you're happy and everything is, is all peachy, right? Now, what, what is over, often overlooked is what comes after, after that. It's con continuous deployment does not end when, when you deploy things to production. There's just, let's say, a first half of the story. What we're missing is, uh, is what we do then, right? once it's deployed. Uh, traditionally, with the operations, right, we need to monitor our software, we need to know what is, what, what is it doing at any moment, any given time, day of the week, hour, midnight, mornings. We need to react to problems that, that come out of, um, out of problem, uh, react to whatever is happening, to, to negative impacts that uh, our software has. And we need to try to figure out how to prevent problems, right? Again, this is what operations do. This is what we, we make companies have whole departments dedicated to those operations. Now, the, the thing that I'm trying to figure out is why most companies who manage to, to, to reach the point of continuous delivery, continuous deployment, why the second part is not automated, right? And uh, I still have a clear answer because all the technology is truly there. Uh, it might not be that easy, but it's, it's, it's really there. So, uh, my theory is that the way what, what our goals are set wrong, right? Most of us are trying to uh, talk to some kind of perfection, right? We're going to develop a software that's going to be perfect, that is never going to fail, that is always going to work, that uh, is never going to have bugs. It, it just bollocks, it does not work. I mean, face it, it will. It will fail. Uh, we, we try to manage that our service is designed to handle any load. 
or uh, had we, we, we buy 100,000, invest 100,000 euros in hardware because that hardware never breaks, right? That's what IBM sold us or whomever. And uh, simply, there is no such thing. You need to design your applications in a way that you expect that things are going to break any moment now, right? Your servers are going to break, your applications are going to fail, uh, you're going to have a marketing campaign that is going to bring you so much traffic that you're not going to be handled to, uh, able to handle the flow. Um, you're going to have bugs, and if everybody has bugs. Whomever tries to put some process to eliminate any bugs is just, uh, you're going to realize that that's never going to happen. So, when I started thinking and started applying self-healing or recuperation for failures and all this stuff, my, uh, the, I, I took examples or uh, inspiration from life itself, right? Because that's, uh, that's a very, that's a system proven over 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 eons to actually work. So what, what are the, what are the elements of, of life and how does life work? First of all, system always matters more than individuals. Doesn't matter whether any individual in any system dies or gets hurt or anything, what really matters is the whole system. Individuals are more or less irrelevant from the life point of perspective. The second thing is that, I'm sorry if anybody is religious, but there was no design that made life in seven days. It's simply small evolutionary improvements over time. We never tried to create something quickly, something big uh, over a day. Or a week. But um, again, this is all from textbooks. I, I just read those things. Another, another important thing about life and how it works is reproduction. Uh, it needs to be capable of reproducing itself. Uh, and the most curious thing about this to me is, is self healing, right? We are constantly attacked by viruses and then we have injuries and many things happen to us every single day. Most of the time we are not noticing and actually still our bodies are managing to recuperate from all those problems to self-heal as ourselves, right? So, um, can we apply that to software? I, I think we can. May it again, require some time, but we, 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 can, we can really do that. We can make systems to mimic the similar aspects and similar features that, that life itself is, is, is mimicking. So the, the most uh, basic part of, of any, any, any living creature here is, uh, is a cell, right? That's, that's the, most, uh, uh, the smallest part that really matters. And cells have, have, have a couple of really uh, cool properties. One of them is that they can restore themselves to, um, to their initial original state. Actually, they can restore the center, they can, they can multiply, so uh, they, 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 they recreate themselves. And they're managing to, they're monitoring their processes all the time. Our body is doing that, and uh, again, through that monitoring, uh, adjusting ourselves, uh, reproducing, we are healing. So, uh, if we try to put this analogy to, to, to computer systems, what would we need in order to create something equivalent uh, to life. Uh, first we need, we, need, uh, we need a body, right? right? That would be our data center. And uh, that, that data center costs everything that we really need. There is no individual service. Individual service doesn't matter really in this story at all. What really matters is our data center, the center that consists of an X number of servers, right? Again, we, then we need something equivalent to our brain which would be some kind of orchestrator, some, some kind of uh, system or part of the body that manages everything around. Uh, then again, equivalent to our different body uh, organs, uh, eyes, ears, nose, whatever you have in your body, uh, that would be microservices. And finally, we get to containers, uh, Docker, Rocket, whichever technology you're using, if you're using. Uh, which would be equivalent to individual cells that form uh, services. And uh, 
we need to be able to scale that uh, using, again, another of cells of containers that makes things very easy. You can multiply containers to any number you want, any number that is really needed. And uh, we need to be able to self heal the system because what the business expects from us today is that we react to problems with such a speed that a human being cannot accomplish that. When your traffic suddenly increases, your business or whomever is, is, is giving your paycheck is not going to tell you, okay, you have a day to actually increase the scale of your system. That does not happen. It cannot happen anymore. That's, that's the business we are living in. Uh, and things need to happen in, in seconds or minutes, but not, not, not slower than that. So uh, any, any system that you would be building that would be really resilient uh, and be able to, to from, from problems, you would have certain, certain elements, let's say, right? Um, you need to be able to discover what your problems are. And I'm now talking completely, completely automated. Uh, I know that you can discover by, by debugging your code and then uh, going through, through logs and stuff. But, you need to have a system that will be able to be able discovering what the problem is. Then, the second element, you need to be able to restore yourself to um, desired state, which is quite different than the design state, because suddenly in the big systems, design state becomes relevant, because if you design your system to, to help to scale, uh, to be scaled to 10 instances, that becomes relevant the next day, because the desired state might be 12 instances, or 8, or 16. Nobody knows, uh, nobody cares anymore what the design is. What we care really is what the current situation is, and what the future uh, prediction of what, what's going to happen is going to be. Next, next that system needs to be able to make decisions, to be intelligent enough to, to decide what's going to happen and to, to adapt to changes, because things happen. Uh, like example, I said before, like market, there was a marketing campaign signing too many users, so day afterwards, nobody wants to visit your site anymore, and you want to be scaled because you don't want to waste uh, computing time, you know, that's something like that. So there are, there are different levels that we need to, to think about when we design systems like that. First level is application, you need to and then that's probably the easiest part, and probably the part that you're already used to, kind of how do you design your applications so, so that whatever happens inside of that application is somehow handled gracefully, right? You might be using, like yesterday we were speaking about uh, reactive model or, or uh, actors or kind of model. I mean, there are so many technologies, but the point is that you need to design your applications that your exceptions are treated really in a in a graceful manner instead of, oh, there was an exception my application is done. That's really unacceptable. But that, that, that's the easy part, part that most of you are already used to. Then we go to one, higher, one level higher, right? The system level, you need to monitor your system con continuously and, um, and uh, try to figure out how to actually make the system work. So again, uh, one instance is relevant, but to really think about this is the whole system and think about that system and tackles. And, and finally, hardware level, which um, if you're using like cloud services like Amazon, Google, computing, uh, you can spin up new servers automatically. That's, that's, that's not a problem. That's, that's something that is already done. But what is more interesting to me is, is the types of, of measures that we apply, right? Uh, most of the years that have been around is we usually try to react. Uh, uh, oh, server is down, we need to fix it. Application is down, we need to fix it. Right? That's, that's, that's quite old and then ineffective way to, to, to handle things because if you expect that you're going to react to problems, then you can't simply prevent those problems from happening and then bad things are going to happen. Like, like in life, you try to prevent uh, you check whether your flight was delayed before you leave in the house, right? Uh, instead of going to the airport and sitting there for five hours like I was doing yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I'm not applying it to my life, right? Uh, preventive, that's, that's already much more interesting, that's much more useful, and, and we already have all the tools that we need. We, we have the tools to monitor this, uh, the, our system, we have the tools to store the information, we have the tools to, to have 
all, all the data that we need to actually really try to figure out what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen one hour from now. So, one of the base tools, uh, any of you using already Docker or do you have clusters? Only two of you, okay. It's hard to travel. Um, the base, you cannot. You cannot really do what we're talking about now with those tools only, but the very good base that you can, very good tools that you can apply as a base for for such a system are one of those three, Mesos, Kubernetes, or, or Swarm. I'm not going to enter into discussion one against the other, because then Carlos will get annoyed. Um, but you, you need to start somewhere, and then there are really good ones, assuming that you're using containers one way or another. So when you think about those, no matter which tools you choose, no matter which approach you choose, there are always, at least all those which I guess I've seen, there are always the same elements in every system. Be it from Google alone, till the Greenfield, small uh, company, many people, we always end up with the same, uh, same architecture, which kind of proved itself to work in a way. Uh, first element, of, of course, we have a cluster, right? We have, I don't know, 100 servers, 50 servers, 1,000 servers, nobody knows how many servers, but it's a cluster, right? And in that cluster, again, you need to stop taking virtual servers, you don't need to stop taking, oh, I'm going to deploy to the server number, number 57, you need to start treating the call, everything you have is a one huge system, right? And then you start deploying containers. Now, when you, when you start, when you deploy the first five containers, that's easy, you just do Docker run and whatever <laughs> you're using Rocket, and that, that part is easy, but then when things start multiplying, you realize that you cannot handle it anymore as you do it normally, and you need to some, have some kind of cluster orchestrator, something that you're going to send information, say, okay, deploy 57 instances of this service somewhere. You need to take care of uh, figuring out where that somewhere is. Uh, now, but since we are deploying so many containers, hundreds, thousands, to our cluster, you cannot keep track of that anymore, right? You cannot have a configuration file that says, okay, my service is in, uh, deployed here, here, and here, and there, right? That does not work because it's too slow, okay? So you need to have some, some kind of place, some service register where you're going to store all your data, all the information about, uh, about your, your system. And that's quite... Um, opposite from what we were doing before, right? Or nobody configures, we should not configure things anymore. We should let things run somewhere and be out to discover it. It's kind of a new, it's not that new actually, but service, service discovery is becoming the norm in a way in, in big systems. But in order to do service discovery, in order to have a place where our information is stored, you need some kind of of a system too that will uh, monitor all your containers and put with information to service registry. Um, and there are already like service, service registry that can be etcd or zookeeper or uh, consul, whatever you use. And registrator, again, there are as many tools as, as you, can, you can imagine that, that do those things, uh, type of things. So tools are not really a problem, it's just figuring out how, how to do stuff. But again, once, once, you, once you have the information, you know that your, your, your uh, registry is continuously up to date and continues to have all the information about everything that's happening in your system, then you can start thinking about putting some kind of monitoring. It can be old fashioned like NAN RDOs, or it can be new stuff like console watchers, or whatever it could be. But uh, uh, once you have the data, and, and remember I'm talking about the system that are, where you're deploying things every 10 minutes or every hour, or really, really frequently. So this, this service registry has dynamic data and then you have some kind of uh, monitoring system that, that is looking what's happening in the cluster, right? But again, this is what we've been doing for a, most of it for a long time, because this is reactive, right? Uh, we're reacting to the problems by monitoring the system. Uh, and then uh, we run some actions to correct that state. So, if my system is supposed to have 57 instances of the service and the load, uh, load times are above uh, half a second, uh, I would run um, 
I set it something in, let's say, Jenkins or uh, console or whatever is your system and correct that to the scale or the scale or do whatever the system, to the system needs to be done to correct scales. That said, that's all reactive. What we're seeing right now is that uh, more and more, at least those that I've seen, uh, we cannot just rely on the current state of the system. We need to have a history of what happened to our system, right? And then once you start getting, uh, collecting historical data, then some really funky things can be done because then you can suddenly do things like, okay, so what was happening last week, same day, at this time? Oh, we had increase in load, okay. Excellent. We can put some kind of intelligence and say, evaluate the past to predict the future. Okay, if, if during the last eight weeks we were having steady, steady increase in load, we can predict that the load will continue increasing. Or we know that every first day of the month we could get their paychecks and go to our site and then suddenly we have a huge increase in traffic. So once you start collecting data, you can start making much more intelligent, much more preventive decisions and, uh, and apply those decisions to, uh, to your system. So the, it's, uh, and the, the, the problem, problematic part is that this, this, this historical data requires a continuous um, Continuous update with your formulas, right? It's kind of a never-ending story. But the difference compared to, to what we were doing, at least in my case before, is that before we were trying to, to react things, now we have an army of people trying to figure out how to make the system more predictive, how to have more formulas that will use all the information that we have and predict the future. And that's kind of I think that that's going to be the, the, the subject of the of, of next couple of years. We're going to be more and more trying to predict what's going to happen. Because once you start predicting what's going to happen, then you can really have design your future actions in a way to prevent or even better uh, enforce certain behavior of, of your system. Right? Um, since this was a keynote, uh, I did not want to go into, into too many technical details because I don't really know your backgrounds. But after after this session, uh, you can you can put me outside and then we can discuss the tools or, or, or uh, the processes in more detail that should accomplish all this. I, I don't know what was the time. Are we good? Yeah, we're good. Okay. So now, uh, do you have any questions for uh, so far? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, so this keynote is like. Yeah. Okay. My question is: This keynote is like a call to action to all of us to think to this kind of future system. Yes. And work on this. Is that? Yeah. It's 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 a call to action that. We've been, we've been neglecting a uh, system point of view of our systems for too long. I think that we've been concentrating too much in the past on, on development, on, on, on uh, management, on, on good practices like PDD, PDD, whatever you're using, but we've been neglecting the systems themselves. And that's mostly because uh, you might be working in a small, small system that uh, do not need those things anymore, but with time, you're going to grow. And uh, imagine if you're, I understand that Amazon is here, for example, very present in this city. They cannot do things without something like this, simply because uh, handling thousands of servers is, is close to, close to impossible anymore. Without uh, some kind of self-healing, or you can use preventive, pre preventive uh, reaction to, to your situations. Um, hi. Yes, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where it is. Ah, there you are. Okay. 
You mentioned about historical data and yes. analyzing this historical data yes. in order to predict. Yes. Do you see this going as far as machine learning, as far as interpreting that data and correlating it with trends like someone got their paycheck or it's Friday and people get off work and do more stuff on your site? Definitely. Um, at the beginning, usually you see at the beginning, you usually skip machine learning because at the beginning you can value, right? So at the beginning you can put very simple formulas yourself, kind of monitor network traffic last seven days, something like that, and try to deduce what's going to happen with your network in the future, right? But once you pass, for instance, many formulas, then you definitely need some kind of, once you pass those easy cases, uh, you will need some, some kind of machine learning. And I, I think that machine learning is going to become, uh, maybe not this year, but uh, in a very near future, it's going to be, become essential part of our uh, processes. Machine learning is going to is going to become as in the future as as, as agile is today. And we are all doing agile. Excellent. Uh, and I think that actually machine learning is going to become part of all our systems. Oh, at least medium to big size systems. It's going to be really, we're going to start forming some kind of intelligence. Uh, and because the way how I see the world moving is that the last actions we're going to do is commit the code. And we need to always do things in advance, be it by uh, telling machine how to do something or, or by coding or doing stuff. But after, after, after you commit things, we are finished. And we are all, most of the world is already there with continuous delivery, continuous deployment. But then calling now is that that does not end there. It does not end anymore um, to the point that your software is deployed, but ends by, by monitoring that and reacting and preventing things. Uh, from there on. But machine learning, yeah, definitely. I did not mention the word, but machine learning is part of this as soon after the first couple of months. <coughs> Who's next? Okay. I don't know. I think they're passing the micros, so. In your previous experience, who was more in charge of uh, orchestrating or implementing such a solution? What department or what area of expertise in the company? Um, it's, it must be a combination of development operations. Um, because if you're talking about more traditional organizations, developers normally don't have enough experience with systems themselves. They don't truly really know how uh, what is really required for a system to work, to work properly. But on the other hand, operation, the traditional operation departments, they, 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 they tend not to know how to code. And right now, we, we're trying to express everything to code. Everything needs to be coded, simply because if you have to accomplish something in advance, you cannot expect any more manual commands. So we need some kind of DevOps department, which is a combination of development and operations and then many other actually uh, departments. You need to involve even an architecture team. You need to involve testers. I'm trying to steer away from, from the notion of departments because I think that each of us needs to have some certain specialized skills um, because we cannot be equally good at everything. But the sole idea about departments, I think that it's uh, it's more counterproductive than, than, than good it gives us. Simply because then we have those silos, and then uh, silos are very, very hard to overcome and cross. And systems like this, uh, uh, something happened. Uh, systems like this and cannot be done anymore uh, to departments, because departments are too slow to react. You cannot have separate departments doing this and that. Uh, and assume that you will be deploying multiple times a day. Simply departments are never going to allow that happening because they are too slow, too many administrative tasks, too many things in between. So I don't know if that answers your question. I'm a bit against departments, but if you would need to combine some departments, that would be development and operations, uh, that would be the major, and architecture would be, those three departments would be the major motors behind something like this. Um, I have a question. 
Yes, please. Uh, have you implemented such a system? And if you did, what what are the costs of implementation? Meaning, everyone will do it in the near future, as you say. But what would it cost? Meaning, that's the coding hours, uh, team effort. What what does it mean? I, I can I can't tell you the cost in absolute numbers because it really depends from case to case. If you're telling hundred hours or hundred thousand hours, I mean anything can go depending on the size of the project and the company and everything. So I can't really give you. And but the cost is, I mean everything we do new has a cost definitely, and uh, you always need to worry about it. Huh? Is it worth it? Really? I think it's worth it. Uh, and, and there are there are very quick uh, there, there are uh, quite a lot of quick means that you can do relatively easily, right? You can uh, start using containers, for example, without a huge cost. You will not do them properly, but you can do it. You can start shipping your you can start creating your first microservice out of your big uh, monolithic application without a huge cost. Now, in the long run, everything costs a lot, right? But I think it's worth it. Now, if if your application is Small, you have 100 users all together, then of course the, the cost of whatever it is is not worth it. Uh, but I generally think that every investment in automation uh, is worth it down the road, assuming that the technology is mature enough. And that's the major question kind of are we, uh, most of us cannot allow ourselves budgets uh, that are assigned to, uh, like, Google has it, or other kind of stuff like that, right? Uh, but once the, the technology becomes available, then we can do that relatively cheap. And for example, containers were used 15 years ago, but only recently they are they're cheap enough to be implemented, and you should use them. And like, um, Kubernetes or, or Docker Swarm is there, it does not require more than a bit to, to learn how to use them. Of course, it, it takes months to master everything, like, like, but you, you can jump start very, very easily. Um, do, uh, you can always employ something like console, for example, to watch your, your system. You will not be preventing stuff, but at least you will be reacting very fast and cheap. So it's kind of baby steps. I, 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 whenever they ask me about prices, I always try to first tell people that you should not you should, if, you, if, you, if you're nowhere in your, close to this, you should not try to do this all at once, of course. You just do step by step. So it's, a, it's, it's evolution, it's not a big bang. But technology is there, and you need to read a few books, and then uh, you will do first 80%. Now, 20, there is a 20% rule, right? The rest of the 20% is going to cost you help, help money, but uh, that, that's a separate story, I guess. Okay, so costs and implementation aside, uh, first of all, how would you go about the cultural aspect of this? Because the mental shift in organization is a bit difficult when you're trying to migrate the ports, containers, continuous deployment and stuff like that. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, first step I would do always is kind of start going towards microservices because without microservices you cannot do this. Uh, simply because you cannot have huge application at scale, or you cannot have recuperate from, from failure of huge applications. So it must be microservices. And once you start going towards microservices, two things are most likely going to happen. Uh, first one is that you're going to most very likely fail, and you're going to fail simply if for no other reason because your organization is not prepared for that. You now there is a Combi's law that says that, uh, paraphrasing, that uh, whatever we do is always a reflection of our organization, right? So uh, you, your organization, in order to, to go in this direction uh, efficiently, should stop. If, I don't know whether it is or not, but if it is, it should to stop being a huge pyramidal organization with uh, command and control stuff. You should have teams, and I think that we're going to have a wonderful talks about uh, the subject. You should have a small autonomous teams capable of doing things with almost complete autonomy. Uh, if you have departments, like, uh, the, the, or the, the guy mentioned departments, if you have those departments, development, testing, integration, uh, requirements, God knows what, and stuff like that, I would not waste money on this. <laughs> before you do, before you change yourself to be uh, 
to have a startup culture. And when I say startup culture, I mean mostly you can have a huge organization. That's not a, that's not what I'm referring to. Startup being small, I'm referring that that uh, until that organization is split into smaller organizations with relative autonomy, you cannot get there. I mean, you can, but it will not be worth internal startups. I mean, yeah, internal startups. We're all working in companies where there are departments and whatnot. I think that that's, departments are the main problem. And, and, and I'm not saying every company always has departments. Uh, the question is whether those departments, what those departments are. There is accounting department, marketing department. I have no problem with those departments at all. What I have, the departments I have a problem with is uh, are departments that split uh, testing and development into two separate organizations. DBA department. Huh? DBA department. Now, but, but, but I'm in no way trying to say that there should not be a person specialized DBA. Not that there should not be a specialized tester or developer. Specialization is good. But splitting those specializations into departments, that's, that's a devastating um, thing to do. Because if he would be alive, can we afford, I would kill him. <laughs> really. Because he made such a damage to our uh, industry by, and I, I understand his theory about factory and stuff like that, that works, but in factory. And, but we are not producing stuff. We are, most of our time, we are designing stuff. We are not a factory. My, um, me typing the keyboard, that's the least, least of my assignments. That's, uh, anybody can type, right? My mother can type, and still she does not design good systems. Uh, so the whole idea about departments and different factories stages that, that needs to go away. Thank you. Anybody else? I think we have four minutes if I'm tracking the time correctly. Nobody else? Take one, take two, take three. Okay, uh, I think you can listen to the next speaker, hopefully more interesting than me. Uh, I would meet you, you can contact me, to my blog over there, uh, buy our books, uh, and have a good time for the rest of the conference. And get me outside if you want to speak more details about uh, this. Thank you.